All right, well, here we are. We're in Exodus chapter 20, so flip over in your Bibles and follow along, and we're going to continue working through the book of Exodus. Um, That's what we've been doing, but we have gone to slow motion as we've hit each one of the Ten Commandments as we've come here to the 20th chapter, and we're at the 10th of the Ten Commandments, and the command is about coveting, and we're going to uncover what this means in the heart and what, what this has done, and as I was studying this week, I came across this poem and see if you don't resonate with it, because I'm afraid in the, not always the good, it, it reveals something about us as it relates to our subject. So here it is. Here's the poem that I, that I came across. It goes like this. It doesn't rhyme, by the way, so don't look for the rhyme. Okay. It was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but it was winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but it was adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but it was 30 I wanted, or probably 40, to be mature and sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 20 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit. I was retired, but it was middle age I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. My life was over, and I never got what I wanted. How true that is, isn't it? Uh, And of course, the great irony of the poem is that he got everything that he longed for and wanted just not when he wanted it. And it illustrates this condition that's in us, that we're always looking for something else. We're never content. We're given more to complain, isn't it? It's true. I've complained about the summer heat, and I, though, I will be whining in wintertime when I have to go get a jacket and it's too cold to go play pickleball. We're always in the process for looking to that next thing over the next hill, wanting something else when God has given us many good gifts right in our lap. But the thing is, this isn't merely a quirk or a defect in us. Actually, it goes down to the heart. It goes much deeper. It testifies to a real serious spiritual problem, again, right in our chest. Or to put it more bluntly, for our Northeastern folks that have transitioned here, it is sin, is what this is. This, and this sin has a name, it's called coveting. It's the discontented, faithless, coveting heart that is never content with what it has, with what God's given it. It's always looking for something else that someone else has, always wanting more, always wanting different, always wanting the other, just something else. So as we come to the theme this morning, again, as we've seen with these commands, it's not merely about what you don't do or what you don't want. That's part of it, of course. And so it begins today, don't covet, okay? But it's more than that. We need to find answers to this. We need to replace this. We need to repent. And so understand, and here's the theme, the only answer for your faithless, coveting, craving heart is this. There's one thing that'll answer it, and it's contentment in Christ alone. That's our word that we're going to see this morning. We're going to see it as we look at three different avenues about our heart, about what God is after on the inside, not merely the outside. And the first is just merely that. If the 10th command is really don't covet, but be content, we'll find it first as we uncover this. Your heart is God's concern. Your heart is God's concern. And we see that first as we just look at the command itself, and then we'll, for a moment, flip over to Genesis. But you understand, as we're working through the Ten Commandments now, and we've come to the last one, uh, there's been a shift that happens from 9 to 10. Uh, All the commands to this point have dealt with actions, really, things you would do, lines you would cross. But now the law turns not to actions, but it turns on motives. It goes from without and goes starts looking within. And what we find is that your heart is what God is concerned with. He's never, ever, as he gave these Ten Commandments, or before this or afterward, he's never been merely about external conformity, a mere outward obedience, say, where your heart is far from God, right? That's what he told through the prophet Isaiah, and then Jesus reiterated it to the Pharisees. 
It's not about external conformity. It's about what's going on inside. And you see this with the command that we have here in verse 17. And so let me read it for you and set it for you. God's targeting the heart when he commands this. Exodus 20, 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And I trust you caught it, the operative word this morning, that what this command's about, it's repeated there. It's about coveting. Don't covet. You shall not covet. Now, unfortunately, I might say, uh, this word covet is a bit elusive. I'd say unfortunately because as I looked it through you know, most of the major English translations, they all use the word covet. And I say it's unfortunate because we don't use that word a whole lot. I don't know the last time I really used the word. I think most often I hear it in church life, right? The expression, oh, we covet your prayers. Uh, that's usually, a, sounds like a good thing. You, you're asking people to pray for you, not something to be outlawed by the Ten Commandments. So what is coveting getting at? And even that expression, I covet your prayers, it illustrates what is fundamentally going at with the word covet. The word covet simply means, most basically, a desire. It's to desire something. It's a want. It's a wish. And if you want things really bad, you could call it a craving even. That's what it is to covet. And so this becomes an important distinction because depending on what you want, the object of your cravings, how badly you want it and the reason you want it, that's going to make all the difference between a good desire or good wanting and a bad wanting or a good wanting and a bad coveting. The point is, desire's not all bad, but it's what you want, why you want it to the degree you want it. And I want to illustrate this for you just by turning back to the early chapters of Genesis. So flip over in your Bibles pretty much to the front and go to Genesis chapter 2. Because as we turn, we're going to look at Genesis 2 and 3 just very briefly. And in this text, we find the root word that's forbidden in the Ten Commandments for covet. We find that root word appear a couple times, and we'll see it once in a good way and then once in a bad way, and we'll see that context, as is usual, is king and determines everything here for us. But as you're coming to Genesis chapter 2, just to set the stage really briefly, right, everything is good still. This is prior to Genesis 3. Of course it is. But what happens in Genesis 3? That's where sin enters. That's where corruption enters. That's where perversion enters, even into the very heart, let alone of all of the world. But that's prior to this, Genesis 2, there there is. And so what we see here, God's making a great place for Adam to live. You know, this is paradise. This is the Garden of Eden. You can't get any better than this. And so we read in verse 9 of chapter 2, God is preparing this perfect place for Adam to live. And we read this. This is Genesis 2, verse 9. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. But there it is. The text describes these trees as pleasant, that is pleasant to look at, that is they're desirable. It's something you want to look at. It's something you you see it and you want to take it and you want to taste of it. Well, that word pleasant there in Genesis 2, 9, it's the same root word to our command when God says, don't desire or don't covet. Only, of course, here in Genesis 2, it's a good desire, isn't it? I mean, God put it there. He gave Adam the best, the most luscious, delicious, delectable fruit trees to delight Adam. So he'd take of it and eat it and turn back to God and say, thank you, you marvelous Lord, for giving me so many good things. And so Adam in Genesis 2, he looks at that. He's right to want that fruit. But then change the context a little. And this word pleasant is not so good. And you just have to turn the page or look over to the next page and see it in Genesis chapter 3. Because we encounter the same root word that we found for covet or desire, only now it's applied to something that is, by God's command, forbidden. And so everything has changed. Look at verse 6 of Genesis 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was, note this, to be desired to make one wise, that's our word. So you could maybe even translate that to it was 
coveted to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Of course, this is Eve, and she's eating the forbidden fruit that God commanded mankind to not eat of it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She succumbed to the temptations and thinking of Satan. Such that she looked at the fruit, and she saw something desirable, namely to make her wise is what she's thinking. This is what Satan's told her. It's going to make her wise, but here's the thing. It makes her wise on her own. She's going to determine what's good and bad for herself. She's going to be wise apart from God. And so though it seemed desirable for that purpose, only the thing is, it's a bad purpose, and so that was a bad desire And she kept thinking about the fruit. She so desired the fruit, though God told her not to, though God had forbidden it. That's a bad wanting. That's coveting. And that's what's so clear, even as now we turn back to the command in in Exodus chapter 20 with this last command. Because the command comes not just as a naked blanket statement. You know, don't desire or don't covet, period, But how does it go? What does it say? Verse 17 again of Exodus 20. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, right? This is not merely to a charge then to don't be jealous of somebody's bigger building they live in. But it goes on. This is about his whole household, everything he owns. You shouldn't want that for yourself. It's his. So verse 17 goes on, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, that is to say, what are we talking about? You shall not covet desire for yourself your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or to be clear, anything that is your neighbor's. You shouldn't see and then look at your neighbor's stuff, his servants, his helps, maybe whoever comes in Moses' lawn, or his employees, or especially his children or his wife, and then think, oh, I want that for myself. I want to take that. You can't do that. It's not yours. Here's the point. God hasn't given it to you. He's given it to your neighbor, and you need to trust God with that. That's how this goes. And of course, it's not just his house or people. It's it's anything that belongs to really anyone else that belongs to your neighbor. And, And that's what's intended as it extrapolates on this household and lists these things, things we all struggle to covet, you know, people's oxes and donkeys. Well, maybe if you live way out in the country, you've coveted people's oxes and donkeys. I've never coveted an ox or a donkey. Actually, I'm glad I've never had one. I don't want to clean up after these things. But try my neighbor's sports car or his newer truck than mine, or truck at all, to be clear, <laughs> or his newer minivan even. <laughs> you, you laugh. <laughs> or his riding lawnmower or his better garden, or his upgraded siding that he doesn't have to keep doing something with. Or maybe it's his job. Oh, if I had a job like that. Or or maybe it's his good relationship that he has with his kids or with his wife. That's all coveting. The point is, that's all sinful wanting. Because here's the wild thing. You see it then, it's not just the stealing That's the sin. But it's the very wanting it for yourself. That's a sin all to itself. And think about this one step further. Again, back to the context of God giving these commands to the nation of Israel by which to live by, right? How do you punish this sin? The sin of coveting? You know, as we've gone through the Ten Commandments, we've looked at the different commands, and then we've traced into the, into the rest of the law, seeing, well, what's the punishment look like? Because that shows what God thinks about it and so forth. You know, we've seen, oh, you commit adultery. Okay, well, the punishment in the Old Testament law was that you had to be stoned, for example, or murder, similar. But there's nothing about what to do when you catch the covetous person. Why is that? Why are there no follow-up laws on how to try and to to punish or discipline the covetous person. Well, how can you ever know if your neighbor actually is coveted or not? I mean, we can see it when their coveting leads to other sins, 
like theft. We saw this with Achan. Remember when we considered he saw it and he even says, I coveted it and I took it. But how can you discern when your neighbor's sinning just in the one thing? And that's the point. You can't. Israel couldn't see it in one another. As fellow church members, you can't see it in one another. You can't see into your neighbor's heart. Israel couldn't detect that, and so they couldn't judge one another about it. Okay, but God is setting them up for how they're going to live in this land and giving them these laws to live by. So why in the world would God bother giving this command, which they can never actually know whether their neighbor is sinning or not? Well, two reasons. Number one, it's evident, it's what we've talked about. He actually cares about your heart. God cares about your desires. Whether your neighbors can see it or not, God cares. And related to that, what's the other reason why he commands about this? Your neighbor might not be able to see into your heart, but guess who can? God can see. He knows what you want. He knows why you want it. And he says this, he knows your cravings, your desires. And he says, actually, and powerfully, Jesus. He was explaining the law in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Right? And you might say he enhanced or he sharpened the law when he was teaching because he would mention, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But then he said, but I'm going to get to the heart of the issue. Anyone who has the intent to look at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. Or similarly, about the murderous crime. He goes back, it's about the anger in your evil heart. But when Jesus did that, understand, he wasn't making things up as if on the spot. Now, he was God. He can, of course, give more revelation. But he was actually doing what the very Ten Commandments do themselves, point you to the heart. Such that, as you go through the Ten Commandments, you know, that that final one, this one that we're talking about, you know, it seems to end on kind of a whimper in a way, right? Don't worship false gods. Don't make idols. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. And then, and then, don't want stuff too much. Really? One commentator put it like this. It would have seemed more logical to begin with the bland, throwaway sin like coveting and then to work up to the big stuff. But coveting is no throwaway, bland, inconsequential sin. Actually, part of the point in putting it at the end seems to show us this. It's actually the root of all of them. It goes back to the heart. And when we look at the heart, we find out that the heart is bent on rebellion. It's bent on sinning. And that's actually what we see next. So we consider this command to be content and not covet. You you find out that your heart is bent on sinning. And we'll see this as we look into Romans chapter 7. So you can go ahead and turn there. Let's look in our Bibles. And let's look at Romans chapter 7 that we heard read for us just moments ago. So you see, by the end of the Ten Commandments, we discover, one, that God is after our hearts, yes, but then the law itself is showing us this. It's showing us, giving us a glimpse inside of our heart, and here is the problem. When we start looking more and more into our heart, what we find, it's not good. You're not going to like what you find there, namely that your heart is bent and inclined by evil desires in the New Testament, and we're going to find them take the law And use it like a mirror, James talks about, to show us what our heart is like, to show us what we're like. Because that's what a mirror does. You know, you you were maybe going out this morning and you're like, I think I'm okay. And then your wife says something, hey, did you look in the mirror lately? And then you know, no, and I better go do that immediately to rectify whatever is happening to me. Well, that's what Paul kind of does with the law. You might feel like your heart's okay. But he takes the law of God's word and it exposes who we are, what our heart is really bent toward. And Paul does it here really in reference to himself. So as we're looking at Romans 7 now, uh, just to set it up very quickly, the, the point of Paul's argument, you know, he's been setting up and explaining the gospel. And as he comes into chapter 7, he's talking about the law's powerlessness to make us right with God. The law has no power inherently to make us right with God. And so then you might wonder, well, what's the point of the law then? Does the Christian ever need the law? 
Maybe the law is even bad. Well, Paul, in response there in Romans 7, verse 7, says, no way. Well, why not? Does the Christian need the law then? Paul says, absolutely, and here's why. He says in verse 7 of Romans 7, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means, he's saying. The law's not bad. It's actually very good. I'm glad we have it. Here's why. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. So he needed the law to show him what sin really was. But it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Now, it's interesting. Paul points finally to our prohibition that we're focusing on, you shall not covet. He goes to that law of all of them to say, this exposed me the most. This showed me what sin really was. This convicted him most of all of his sin. Now, why? Why is it this command he focuses on? Well, he said, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said. But is he merely talking about information? I would not have known what sin was unless God had told me what it was. As if to say, oh, I didn't know that was sin. Oh, no, well, I'll, I'll change things. No, that's, that's not how he explains what's going on at all. He's not talking about identifying sins through new information. He's talking about what the law did. It showed him sin by experience because it stirred it up and revealed it right in his heart. Because he goes on rather biographically here and explains what happened in his heart when he heard the command, you shall not covet. He says, verse 8, But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. We talked about this. Sin lies, as it were, like dormant, hibernating, asleep. We use the picture of like a cave is your heart or your, yourself, and inside you've got a sin bear, B-E-A-R, the animal, and he's hibernating in there. And the law came in like a stick and wakes the bear up and shows you how horrible of a sin-covening bear you have. It's not that the law that poked the bear put the bear in there, no, nor was it that it make the bear do bad things or do bear things? No. The bear was always there. The command just came in to wake it up to show us what's really in our heart. That's what the command does. Shows us what's in our heart. And what did Paul finds in his heart is all kinds of covenant. Or to think about it like this, the law exposes our God allergy. As we come into this world as born sinners, we have a God allergy. We sneeze whenever we think about God. We have an allergic reaction to Him, just reflexively. God comes, and by default, we're like, no. That's our sin nature, our sin bear that's in there. And that's what's natural, natural for us. And that allergy it might lay dormant in you until it is pricked with God's law. And that creates all of the, the flare-up that's going on in this rebellious spite. You just do all the more to disobey. Why? Because you're, you know, you have a bad growing up environment. Because there's these scars in your past. No. Why do you rebel? Because you're a sinner, and you're a sinner right down to your heart. And it was this command that did it more for Paul than any other that truly exposed who he was. And this is Paul. Remember him like before he was converted? The Pharisee. The great respected teacher, like the kind of the, the up and coming star of Israel. But it was this command that takes somebody like him who looks so good on the outside. But then he gets this command that's all about the inside, and that's where he starts to see it. He's not fooling anybody. He goes on, remember, it says there in verse 8. This rebellion gets multiplied and stirred up from the inside. He says, it's produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Not produced out of me all kinds of sins, but it was stirring them up right in my heart. It was the catalyst thrown in to show what's really there. Sin resides in the heart, and that's what the law shows us. Let's see another text. Turn over with me to James chapter 4. 
So move right in your Bibles, and let's go to the book of James. So get through all of Paul's letters. You're going to hit the book of Hebrews, and then you're at the book of James. And we're going to look at James chapter 4. Really, right from the top. What we find, Paul was really focused first on what's going on in the desire. He's dealing with that command coveting. But James here, he's going to work the other way. He's going to work backwards. He's going to say, hey, look at these things going on in your life, these sins, and let's work it back and see where they came from. So, for example, verse 1 begins, he's asking about causes. Where did this stuff come from? What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? You know, why are you guys bickering in the church? Why are you guys fighting each other? Why are you going to war? Why are you at loggerheads? In your marriage or in your relationships, why is that going on? He's going to give you the answer. Keep going, verse 1. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Hmm. What's the cause? Where did it all start? What started the fire? Well, it's your passions. Think desires. And they're at war right within you. It's not, we didn't start the fire, right? No, you did. And you fanned the f- into a huge flame right in your chest. Look at verse 2. You desire and you don't have. So what do you do? You go murder. Or he goes on. You covet and you cannot obtain. So what do you do? You fight and you quarrel. See, there it is. You have these very external sins. He's dealing with stuff, right, directly from the Ten Commandments when he talks about murder or fights and quarrels. But what explains this? How did those things start? You know where they started? Right in here. You desire, you don't have, so what do you do? You go kill for it. Or more expressly in the ESV here, where it says, you covet, okay, and you can't have it, so what then do you do? You go fight for it. You wrangle, you quarrel. Ah, What a diagnostic tool this is. To uncover the source of really your sinful problems in your life. To to show you where where these things go wrong. So, such that when there are conflicts, fights, and quarrels, you can always work it back to the source. To your sinful, selfish heart. Admittedly, it might not be the only sinful, selfish heart in the mix, but yours is in it. So, two things we got to take from this. First, really, this is a practice we need to develop into our repentance and our everyday turning from sin to be more like Christ, such that when we've sinned, whatever the action was, we should work it back to uncover what were the sinful desires that started it all, because that's where it began, and that's where you can root it out. You know, it's like a weed, right? There's weeds in my yard. If you just go and try and pluck them without getting the root, guess what happens? It comes right back. You got to get to that root desire. So for example, you yell at your kids. Let's just imagine. Maybe on the way to church. Confession time, okay? You yell at your kids. Well, what was that about? Well, I was angry. Yeah, but what desires were leading to your angry outburst? Maybe it was pride. Maybe you were embarrassed by your kid's disobedience. And so you took it out on them to embarrass them or yell at them. And here's where it's tricky. Say with that example of your children. You should be respected as a parent, right? Yeah. Children obey your parents and the Lord. (laughs) It's biblical. My kids are supposed to obey me. It's a fine desire to want their obedience to want respect from your children. That's actually a good desire. You should be as a parent trying to cultivate and help them in that. The issue is, what happens when you don't get that from them? Oh. What happens when you don't get what you want? Such that if you respond in an ungodly way, a sinful way, then you can be sure whatever you thought your right desire was, it actually was an ungodly one. Yeah, perhaps you really want their obedience, and that seems like a good thing, but why do you want it? Maybe you want it because you're just a selfish parent. 
Why? Because obedient children makes life a lot easier. Kids, get in the van. They're all in and they buckle themselves. Imagine. Life would be so simple this way. And so the selfish, sinful desire in you goes to war, gets angry when it doesn't get what it wants. And that's the crazy thing about all this desire stuff. You can have what could be a good desire. It's a good thing to want it. Again, your kid's obedience. But if you want it too much, you're willing to sin in other ways when you don't get it. Well, you can be sure that your desire for their obedience actually wasn't a good one. Because in this case, it was far more about you than it was ever about them worshiping God. That's the first thing. Trace it back. Second, that we must take away from this. We got to see there's not only wrong actions rooted in evil desires, but you need to see that those wrong desires are actually sins in and of themselves. You need to see this. They of themselves are disobedience to God. And realizing this again puts the impetus to try and snuff it out right from the start, to dig out all of the root of that weed. So, for example, in his book, You Can Change, Pastor Tim Chester provides here three examples of what this looks like when you see the the power of seeing the sin is in the desire itself. He puts it like this. He said, I found so much freedom simply by realizing that sinful desires are sinful. He provides some examples. So, I feel myself getting bitter. Once I might have fed my desire by reflecting all the wrongs I endure. But I realize now that bitterness is grumbling against God's goodness. And so in my best moments and with God's help, I try to stop it before it grows. You see this? He goes on. I feel myself getting annoyed. I once might have fed my desire by reflecting on other people's incompetence. You know, trying to justify why I'm annoyed. But I realize now I get annoyed because of my sinful desire to be in control instead of trusting God's sovereignty. Or an example we already used, but he goes on. I feel myself getting angry. I once might have fed my desire by reflecting on how I've been mistreated. But now I realize that I get angry because of my desire, my sinful desire, I would add, to justify myself instead of trusting in Christ. And so I try to stop. But see, if you don't see or recognize the sin and the desire itself, you don't feel the urgency to cut it off right there. Instead, we end up harboring these thoughts and then feeding them, justifying why we can have these thoughts, and surely they cultivate in many other sins. So stop harboring evil thoughts, evil desires, justifying those, thinking, well, they're not really sins, they're not hurting anyone, they're just thoughts in my brain. I'm never following through on these. No, they're not just thoughts, they are sins. It's disobedience against your Redeemer. Okay. Well, what's to be done about this evil heart that we have? Well, here's the answer. Your heart is only content in Christ. Your heart can only be content in Christ. So what do we do now? We found out that as our mission control center, That is, when the Bible talks about the heart, often it's talking about the the control center of how we think, how we feel, how we want, how we desire, what we will. And what are we supposed to do? Because I think you know from your own experience, it's not easy to just stop it. You know, that, that would be nice. Let's just have the sermon right now. Stop sinning and wanting sin, period. We all go home and we're all fixed. That's not how this goes, is it? It's hard to change your appetites. Try it with your kids. Try changing their appetites. Our our desires, evidently, they're not like a switch that I can just reach in here, click. Or no, like a radio dial. Let's just tune up to the Christian station. Okay, I'm good. It's not how this works. In the first place, you need a new heart, okay? You need spiritual life in you given by Christ. And that happens when you come to faith, right? The Spirit comes to live, in, live within you. You're no longer enslaved and bound to sin. But even then, for the Christian, it doesn't mean all sin and temptation just vanishes either. 
So how do we get those evil desires out of us? Well, to illustrate how this works, John Piper used this illustration and it referenced a puzzle that you've probably heard before. Let's imagine you have a glass beaker, you know, like one of those chemistry test tubes, and your assignment is to get all of the air out of the empty glass beaker. And you're in a sophisticated science lab. You know, you've got all kinds of machines and instruments. And so how are you going to get all the air out? We're prone to think, well, you need to get some special vacuum and suck all the air out. Well, if you had a special vacuum on the top of that test tube, and then once you turn the vacuum off, what happens? All the air goes back in. So maybe you're like, i got to suck it out and get like a vacuum seal on the top. We're prone to think that we can just suck it out. And again, like in our own hearts, that we can just suck out all the evil desires. But that's not how this works. You, you know the answer to the puzzle. How do you get all the air out of that empty glass beaker? You don't suck it out. You drive it out. How do you do that? You fill the beaker to the brim with water. You replace the air with something else. The air removes, or excuse me, the water removes all the air, so there's no room for the air to come back in. It's in the words of Thomas Chalmers, this famous essay. It's about the expulsive power of a new affection. You, you can't just suck the desire out. You've got to put a new desire in, something that's stronger, that's better. And so you see, it's not enough to stop craving the sinful stuff. You need to change the object of your affections. You need to let faith and a love for Christ, a satisfaction in Him, so drive out the love of the world. Or to put it in the words of that old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of the earth will go strangely dim, won't they? In the light of His glory and grace. A look of faith and a love for Christ will drive out a love for the world from your heart. And so look very briefly with me at two New Testament texts that show us this. Turn over to Philippians chapter 4. Look at Philippians chapter 4. And here, the operative term we're going to see in these two texts is the word contentment. Contentment. Contentment looks in faith to Christ, is satisfied with Him, knowing He's enough. And that's what will slake and answer our wondrous cravings. So first off, you're here in Philippians 4, and Paul's, where's the context? He's commending the Philippians for their financial support. They've been giving him money on occasion. And he thanks them for that, but then he adds this, verse 11, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Whatever situation. Like, what are you getting at, Paul? What kind of situations do you mean? Verse 12. For I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What's the secret he's talking about? He's talking about, from verse 11, the secret of contentment. He can be at the highest highs, getting all kinds of money from them to do the ministry, and he can be in the lowest lows. Like now, he's in a prison cell, as he writes to the Philippians. And he says, I'm content. Actually, throughout this letter, he says more than that. He says, I got joy. Paul, what are you talking about? That is crazy. How can you be in the high highs or the low lows and just be steady and satisfied and content? Verse 13, how can you do it? It's where he's looking. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That is just the quintessential look of faith. That's not looking at his circumstances. He's not looking at possibilities. He's looking out to the one who will give him strength to walk through whatever this is. It's the acknowledgement of trust to say, God, I know you're in control. Whether you provide a whole lot or whether you don't give me what seems like enough, I know it's all in your hands and so am I. And you're going to carry me through this. That's contentment. And so you see, what's the answer for a constant cravings and always wantings? Yeah, it's contentment, but where does that come from? When I need it. All right, let's look at one more text. Flip over, back right in your Bibles, and let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. So we were in James a minute ago. It's the book right before that. The book of Hebrews, the very end, chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. And again, the watchword from this is contentment. 
And he begins in verse 5, and he opens with a form of coveting that's so common to any of us, the love of money or greed, always wanting more, usually then to buy what others have and so forth. But that kind of coveting needs to be put aside, and instead, well, let's just read it. Verse 5, Hebrews 13. Keep your life free from love of money, coveting money. And instead, what? Be content with what you have. So there, there's, there's the put off, put on that we've been talking about. Don't covet. What's the replacement? Be content with what you have. Don't be looking to buy more stuff. Be content with what you got. What's the answer to the loving more money? Contentment with what God has given you. Now, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Like the child complaining against his sibling. You, both, you dish out ice cream to both of them, and then they look at the bowl immediately to see who got more. And then the one that got less invariably goes, this isn't fair. And the compassionate parent I am, I go, be happy you got any. Yeah, this ain't easy. Because most of us live in the if only mentality of life. If only I just had a little more money. If only I just had that better paying job, that just next threshold, then I'd be content. Then I'd be set. If only I had a house or just a slightly bigger house or if only my college debt was paid off, then I'd be set up. Or think of it, if only I had that kind of ministry in the church, boy, then I'd know I'm really serving God. If only I just got thanked once in a while for the service I do. It's the if only, just fill in the blank, whatever that is for you. If only, then. Then I'd be happy. Then I'd be content. Then I wouldn't need one thing more. That's what we tell ourselves. We don't buy that for a second, though, if we think about it. But that's how we think. We have this if only mentality. To which, to be clear, this is the mentality of discontentment. Or to our word today, it's the mentality of covetous desire of the heart. I trust you see it then. This discontent we have comes from a serious lack of trust in God. Either that he cares for you, one, or that he knows what he's doing. And so what's the answer to that? But well, we stopped in the middle of verse 5, so let's finish it out. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Okay, how? What's the secret? How do I get there? What do I need to know? Here it is. For he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Brothers and sisters, this is it. How can you always be content with what you have? Do in Christ, you know what you have. You, do you know what you have in Christ because of his cross work? Do you know what you have that can now never be taken away from you? Him. He's given you himself. Such that as he gave himself on the cross, he then will never leave you or forsake you. He promised he is with you. Even when you're feeling in greatest need. Again, Paul, in prison, am I ever going to get out? Or he's being beaten to the extreme level. And what does he say? I'm content. Because he knew Christ was right with him and would never abandon him. I trust you can feel it. The glory of those words that Christ screamed from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Son of God said that. But why did he say it? So you would have the assurance that in Christ, you will never be. No matter what you're walking through, in Christ, you are never forsaken. He will never leave you. And it's from that assurance, with that contented joy, whatever is your immediate circumstance, this we know. Verse 6, so in light of that, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What's the worst you can bring? Because you can't take Christ from me. And so even in our feelings of greatest need and frustration, 
We're always wanting more. We're wanting something different. We're wishing for this. Maybe we're even aching for it. Why? Why? Remember, he is with you. He gave his son for you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He's your helper in this. Or as Paul puts it in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? How do we know he's for us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If he's willing to spend his son on you, do you think he's willing to withhold whatever you think you really need? Can you trust that God who would give his son for you? Who's gracious like this, generous like this? Because when you do, that's when you find contentment. You find it at the foot of the cross because there's no greater gift that he can give than himself. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the answer to our cravings, our wantings, our lustings. Direct your affections, your desires, your faith to this Christ. Let's pray together. Father, what a gift you have given us. Forgive us. Forgive us for not being mindful of your many mercies, your gracious gifts in Christ. Forgive us for wanting different, not able to trust you. Forgive us for this, for it's a discredit to the cross. And yet, even for these cravings, you have forgiven us in Christ. You've given us your son's righteousness. And in that assurance, may we walk in joy. Once again, knowing that even still you have not left us or forsaken us, and you will see us all the way home. And so may we, from that contentment, always be trusting in you. Give us at a church to be strengthening one another as we walk through trial, to always be looking to you in faith. For there we find contentment and the answer to our cravings. You make our hearts restless till they find rest in you. Do that for your people, we pray.